Hi, everybody. Good evening. If you're in my part of the world or good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, wherever you're tuning in from. And um, this is Lynn Serafin from TrentinoGenealogy.com. Today is uh, our uh, monthly Philo Friday podcast. Uh, hello, Joanne. Hello, Marie. Hello, everybody who's just been coming in. I haven't said hello to yet. And today is Friday, the 5th of February, 2021. And uh, as some of you know, if you've already seen uh, me post it in the group, the topic for today, I'm going to mention in a minute, because I just realized what I haven't done is tell you what Philo Friday is. <laughs> okay, for those of you who may be new, uh, Philo is a word that comes from the word to spin. And it is a Philo is a tradition in Trentino, was a tradition in Trentino uh, before the era of TV and all these things like that where people where families gathered <coughs> excuse me between dinner and bedtime to tell stories and uh, they would they would get together to stay warm it was a way of trans uh, uh transferring or transmitting oral history preserving family traditions a way of entertaining um it was just a really lovely practice of storytelling and the reason why it's called philo is kind of a double meaning. Some of it has to do with the fact that, yeah, they're spinning a tail, which is kind of kind of neat, and it's a more figurative sense. But it was actually also the time where women uh, would sit and do the weaving of the various yarns and while they were listening to all the stories. And I, I would imagine some of them told stories too. So at any rate, this is Philo Friday. There's an accent on the O oh, Philo Friday, and we do them once a month. We started them about a year ago. Can you believe it? We started them about a year ago when all these lockdowns started. And now we've been, uh, first we were doing them every week and then every couple of weeks. And now we're doing them every month because it's it's really hard to keep up with them. So anyway, so now these are every first Friday of every month, Philo Friday. And so now that you know what Philo is, now I'll tell you what tonight's topic is. Uh, tonight's topic is the ancient families of Caldez. Now, Caldez is in Val de Sole, but only just. <laughs> and if you look at a map, we've talked a lot about Val de Non, which is over, if you're looking at the province, it's over on the top on this side. Now, Val de Sole kind of goes lengthwise, going right into Val de Non to its west. And below Val de Sole is the uh, exterior or the interior part of Val Judicari and Valrendena, which comes down below it. Now, where Caldez is, is right where the two provinces, Valdenon and Valdesoli, meet. So there's a lot of crossover between the two, uh, between Caldez, it's kind of a crossroads for a lot of different places that are also in Valdenon. The other thing that's really important, and when you see the map, you'll understand that uh, Caldez also has a lot of other parishes quite close to it. One of the most important being uh, Malay, and for that reason, sometimes if you're looking for something in Caldez, you might find it in Malay, or in Malay, you might find it there. And it's also quite close to Semoclevo. And so all of these parishes are going to be quite related to each other in terms of your research. So I, again, I wish I could show you these pictures. Um, it's, a, it's a limitation of Facebook Live. But uh, when you see the pictures, you'll you'll see why understanding the geography of this area is very very important, and um, and how how and also understanding how the parishes were organized in terms of the deaneries or the deconati, um, where one parish was the head of a bunch of other little parishettes or daughter parishes to it. So understanding that relationship is very uh, important to doing your family history research when you're dealing with these parishes. All of this will be explained when I put together the blog article. Now, when I'm talking about Caldez tonight, I want to say there are uh, two primary sources that I'm going to be drawing upon. One is um, this book written by somebody who just joined our group. Yay. Um, this is a book on Caldez, a story of a noble community by, and it's in Italian and it's beautiful. And it's written by Alberto Mosca, who is in this group. Uh, I, I haven't read the whole thing, <laughs> but I've been reading his section on the families, the old families of Caldez. But I, the reason why I started reading that is that um, these last, <coughs> excuse me, I still am having problems with my voice. Um, I was uh, doing some research for Robert Yusko in this group. 
And a lot of his lines came from Caldez. And suddenly I realized that they were um, all showing up in something really, really special that I'm going to be discussing tonight, which is the other source that I, I'm drawing upon. And those are the family trees constructed by a priest named Don Tommaso Botea in the 19th century. Now, I'm going to tell you about these trees. I'm going to tell you what they are, where to find them, what they show, what they don't show, and a whole lot of other things, how to use them in your family history, uh, because they're useful, but they're more or less a starting point. They're not precise in a lot of ways. So um, that's what I'm going to be discussing about them. And then after I introduce you to that, I'm going to be going through some of the most ancient names in Caldez, uh, surnames that is in Caldez, uh, and uh, a little bit about their history, where they came from, uh, where they showed up, but I can't go through all of them. So forgive me if I'm not going to get to every single surname that you might be familiar with. So ciao to everybody. Uh, and yes, I see some of you know this book and it is a wonderful book. The other book I'm drawing upon a little bit is um, this one by Taborelli de Fatis, which is on uh, Trentini uh, nobility. It doesn't have everything, but it has some things that I've drawn upon. I drew a little bit upon the Bertoluzza Guida ai um, Cognomi, which is the guide to surnames, but it really doesn't tell as much as these other books. So between these books, the family trees of Botea and my own research, that's what I'm basing and everything we're going to be talking about tonight. Okie dokie. So let's get started. So, uh, and even if you don't have Caldez ancestors, I hope you find it interesting because I find it interesting and I don't think I have any Caldez ancestors. So, okay. So as I said, Caldez is in Val de Sole. It's on the border of Val de Non and it's very close to San Clevo and Malaysk. Bear that in mind and other, other places like uh, Terzalas and um, Corviana and places like that. Now, I want to talk about the priest that I mentioned. A lot of people don't realize how many Trentino historians were priests and probably still are. Um, some of the best historians out there have been priests and there are a lot of good reasons for that. One is that they uh, they were educated, <laughs> that's that's key. Uh, they said so they could read Latin and um, and also they, they uh, usually came from the place, not usually, but well, I would say yes, in the in the earlier days. They usually came from the place where they worked or near the place where they worked. So they were intimately familiar and they had kind of a vested personal interest in it. And so they, between their education, their personal interest, and um, if they had that inclination towards history, they became some of the best historians out there. Now, this particular priest we're talking about, his name is Tommaso Vigilio Botea. He was actually born in Monclasico, which is not far from Malay. So it's it's and it's very often the Monclasico records are part of the Malay records. Uh, and so he was quite familiar with that whole area. He served actually as the parroco, meaning the, the pastor, the head of the church in Caldez, and also the dean or the deacon of the whole area uh, until his death. Now, he was born in uh, Monclasico in 1819. He died in Malay in uh, 1895. I found his death certificates. Lovely. I love it when I find uh, death certificates for the um, or death entries for for the priests because they they talk a lot about them in in those i'll share the photos of those when i do the article anyway so he's got that long history uh and so his whole the area that he was the deacon of included san bernardo de rabi in val de rabi caldez which we're talking about tonight de maro monclasico bolentina piazzolo terzolos samoclevo Cavizzana, Magras, and Pracorno. So all of those areas he was in charge of for quite some time. But he was uh, an historian predominantly uh, in Malay and Caldez. That's, and he's actually done a collection of family trees of the ancient families of those two parishes. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Malay ones tonight. That's for another topic some other time. So tonight we're just going to be looking at what he covered in Caldez. Now, when I say the family trees, let me tell you where you can find them because you can see them if you have access to the either the digital images in Trento or the um, Family History Center 
uh, microfilms or if they've digitized them by now. I'm not sure if they have. Now, I know a lot of the family hist history centers are currently closed, but if and when you do get, get back to them, let me tell you where it is. I'll give you the actual microfilm <laughs> number if you need it. It's 138. 8647, that's the microfilm number, and it's part three of that microfilm number. They are at the end of the third volume of baptismal records. They're just stuck at the end. You just, you're going along, you're looking at records, and suddenly you find all these trees. It's at, the same thing happened when I was looking at the Malay records. I found those a few years ago when I was in Trento, and I said, wow, this is so cool. And so I got the images of all of those and took them home because they're really worth studying. Um, so that's where you can find them. And again, if that's a lot of information to take in, I'll have it all written down when I when I do the, uh, the blog articles. You can see the numbers and take note of that. But that's where you'll find them. You'll find them at the end of volume three of the baptismal records in the Calde uh, Caldez uh, parish registers. So what are included? What are the trees that are included in there? He does trees for the most uh, ancient of the families that were still in existence at the time he wrote them. So this is at the end of the 19th century. There's one really ancient family, probably more than one, um, that I found in the records and I've also read about in other places that he doesn't cover because they were already extinct by the time he wrote them. And I'll, I'll mention that family because I think they're worth mentioning because they seem to have been ancestors of some of the other families. But I'll, I'll, let me just first list the families that he actually covers. So if you have any of these surnames in Caldez, he's done trees for them. And again, I'm going to tell you that they're not like really, really detailed trees. So I'm going to give you the limitations and what to expect from them. But here are the surnames. The surnames he's covered are Antonietti, Bonomi, Kova, Manfroni, Malanotti, Lorenzo, Fatarsi, Rosana, Scaramella, and Rizzi. Okay, so those are the ones that he's covered for Caldez. He has a whole bunch of other ones for Malay. Now, he, there are also a couple of trees in that same section for the Guarnieri and the Leite families, but uh, and uh, also an extension of the Rizzi family, but these are made by somebody else in the 20th century, so they don't go as far back, and I'm not going to talk about them tonight. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, uh, yes, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to be able to cover everybody because this is a 45-minute broadcast, and so I have to kind of squeeze in as much as I can. Uh, let me first tell you about how these trees are organized, what they contain and what they don't contain, because that's really important. First of all, the trees only have, because they're surname studies, there are no women on them. <laughs> the only women you're going to see are the um, wives. And on a few trees, I noticed he did have a, a daughter in the case of when the tree was going extinct and the daughter then married into another line. Uh, and then the name was adopted by the other line. However, for the most part, the only women you're going to see are the wives. You're not going to see any, like if you're looking at Antonietti, you're not going to see Maria and whatever. You're not going to see these women with that surname, only the men. Furthermore, you're not going to see every single child that a couple had. You're only going to see men who had children. So if somebody died, uh, in, when they were young uh, and didn't have a family or never married, they're not there unless they happen to be important in some other way. The exception to this is priests. You will see priests written in, in the tree. So the, and it'll say prete, it'll say priest in, in the tree. So essentially, so let's say you have Giovanni's here and then he's got a son Antonio and this, another son Giovanni and a son Bernardino there and then their children and then there are sons and then their sons. So that's all you're going to see. Sons of sons of sons who carry the surname because this is a surname study. All right. So uh, and next, next, next. Now, how are they organized? They do have the names of wives, as I just mentioned. If the if Botea could figure out or find a record for the surname of the wife, it has the surname of the wife. And that's quite cool. Uh, if they're further back in time, where, as uh, some of you have done research, uh, know a lot of baptismal records further back in time won't say the surname of the mother. And then if it's before the 
uh, the beginning of the marriage records, then you're not going to know the surname, surname of the mother at all, of the wife at all. So it will just give her first name in that case. So how he has it, he has like a little circle. So let's say there's Giovanni so-and-so and Maria so-and-so, and then there'll be a date in that little circle for that couple. Now the date is the date of the marriage of that couple. It's not the birth date of the man or of the wife or of the death date. Sometimes you'll see death dates and the death dates are signified by a little cross. But the, but the date that's in the little circle is the marriage date of the couple, if known. Now, if, they, if, if it's before the records begin, then he does an estimated date. Now, how does he estimate it? Well, the same way we estimate dates that we don't know, he estimates it by the, the year of the first known child, the first child that has been found to be uh, in the records or interpolated to be in the records. So they, he gives an estimated date. As you can imagine, this is a starting point for research. It's not a complete uh, guide. It's not a do-it-yourself, all bells and whistles, my tree is done research. Um, the other thing is some of the writing is a little difficult because some of the dates have been scribbled over or notes have been inserted. And occasionally you have to try to figure out what in the world he's saying. That said, they're beautiful. They're beautifully laid out. And he also does a lot of artwork. He was an incredible artist. He, he drew this, hand drew the stemmy. I'm assuming he did them, um, meaning the coats of arms, the different shields. And he also then writes a little story about when those coats of arms were um, awarded, when the titles of nobility were awarded, because different families would have multiple titles conferred on them. Uh, and different periods of time. And he does have those. Some of the families have more than others. And not all of these families are noble, but an awful lot of them are. So how do you use this in your research? Well, you're probably already imagining that, um, well, I have a female ancestor with this name. Uh, how do I research her? Well, the first thing you got to try to do is see if you can find her um, her baptismal record and then see if you can see her mother's name and or at least the first name of the mother and then you look on the tree and try to match that girl to a couple that that's up there because he's got them all he should i don't i haven't found any that he's left out at least not in the ones that i've researched um and so if you can find a couple that match her parents then you can look at his either date or estimate of the marriage and you can construct the family from there. And then once you know that line, then you can keep going back because then it's then it's a straight line. But again, if it's quite far back, all of these dates are going to be um, a little bit just estimates. The other one thing I noticed, there is one tree, one or two trees where he seems to skip quite a few generations because I think his evidence was patchy in terms of um, the names where they appeared in older pre-register records and meaning like uh, parchments from the parish. And in those cases, it's really hard to piece it together, but you get an idea of who the ancient, ancient ancestor was. Uh, just to give you a, a brief outline, a, a brief idea of where you're going, the Caldez baptismal records start in 1605. All right, so they don't go back, 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 back to the 1500s like a lot of parishes. However, some of those early records are going to be found in Malay, but not all. So if you can't find something in Caldez, you might look over in Malay. You might find it there. It might not be there. You might find evidence of a person who exists. You know he exists or she exists because of other evidence, but you cannot find the record because... Somehow it's gotten lost in the fray between 1605 and hope the records over in Malay. That does happen. The marriage records, I think I wrote that down to, I think they go down to, uh, hold on, the baptisms of 1605, marriage records start in 1618. There are loads of little gaps in it though, so it's a little tough. Anyway, I will have all those details in an article when, when I put the article together. So let's move on. Let's move on. Now that I've given you an idea and kind of whet your appetite over the uh, Botea trees, which I think are just such a goldmine of information, just historically interesting and, and aesthetically interesting because they're beautiful to look at. Let's look at some of the ancient families. The one family that I came across, and I came across this when I was doing Robert's tree, that is not in the Botea um, list 
is a family called Dalla, Dale Caneve. Dale Caneve. And the reason why, I mean, I'm hypothesizing, the reason why they are not in his list is that they seem to have died out around the year 1600. So there's not much in terms of documented evidence. You do find mention of them in the early uh, part of the 1600s, but then as a surname, they die out. However, I have to say that um, Alberto Mosca seems to believe that they were the kind of source family or the pre-family of several other families, which I'm going to talk about, or at least two other families. I don't know about several, but at least two two other families in Caldez where, who, you know, whose names are quite m more well known. But I did want to mention them because uh, they, the Dale Caneve, they actually go back to the 1300s, but then they died out um, around the year 1600. So if you see that name in your tree, understand that it's only going to go so far. So let me see, did I organize this in a sensible way? Right, okay, no, not entirely. <laughs> okay. I'll come back to the Dalekaneve in a bit because I, my, my list of surnames is a bit all over the place. I'm gonna jump to the name <coughs> Bonomi. Now Bonomi is an interesting name because if you remember last month when I talked about types of surnames, I mentioned of uh, one type, I mentioned patronymic. I need to take a drink, excuse me. <clears throat> now, patronymic, if you remember, means it's drawn from the, the name of a father, of a patriarch. So it's a personal name of a patriarch. Now, Bonomi comes from a personal name, Bonomo. I remember growing up in New York, we had, um, uh, do you, if you're my age and you grew up over there, maybe you remember they had a candy called Bonomo. They called it Bonomo, Turkish taffy. And it was like really horrible, sticky candy. It really rotted your teeth. But <laughs> but it's spelled the same way, but it's in, in, uh, in Italian, it's Bonomo, because it's two words, Bon and Omo, uh, or Homo, H-O-M-O in Latin, meaning good man. So Bonomo means a good man. Bonomi means the descendants of a man named Bonomo. Now, the thing about Bonomi is it's found in lots of parts of Italy, in lots of parts of Trentino. And the Bonomi of Caldeas are not necessarily related to Bonomi in other parts of the province. I haven't found the connection yet. They could be. I have uh, Judicari ancestors who are Bonomi. I, they've been in the Judicari forever. And I really don't know if they have any connection to Caldes. There's also Pinzolo Bonomi. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to stick my hand up in the camera. <laughs> Pinzolo Bonomi. I, they, that's a little closer to Caldes, but not right on its doorstep. So I have no idea if they're connected. I, I haven't done enough research to figure that out. But at least the ones in um, in Caldes apparently didn't start from there. They came from Cavizzana, which is not very far from Caldes. And they do go back to uh, to the end of the uh, or the early 1500s, coming into Caldez. So Alberto Mosco said, "I have a lovely uh, stemma that Botea drew that I'll share with you later." He says that the first uh, Mosca, this is said that the first um, reference to them is that Pietro Bonomo, who was ennobled in. Uh, 1370 by the Emperor Carlo the Fourth. So this goes way back. So they were nobility way back. But this is in a record that appears in the 1600s. And then they had several other um, several other uh, uh, accolades put on them later, which I'll I'll put in the article because it's just more dates and more names. But it does. Uh, he believes that. Yes, this is one of the families that he believes came from that Dalla Caneve. Why? Because he says, if you look at Dalla Caneve, the name Bonomo appears many times in their family. So he believes that it was repeated traditional name, recurring traditional name in Dalla Caneve. And therefore, at some point, somebody said, okay, well, we're going to call ourselves the children of Bonomi instead of Dalekanevi because this makes more sense and it defines us from the other lines. So that's his theory. Now, I, I haven't analyzed all of his data because it's a lot, <laughs> So, but that's that's his theory with that. So that's what Bonomi, they're very old, uh, very, very old uh, surname, very old noble family of Caldez, originally from Cavizzana. 
and, uh, and but in other parts of the province, specifically, uh, most most prominently in Pinsolo and also in the Judicari, and they may not be related. Okay. Next surname I want to cover is Manfroni. Now Manfroni, what a great name, Manfroni. <laughs> Manfroni. Manfroni is another patronymic. It's a patronymic based on a name that I'd never heard of before, Manfrono. It could be like Manfred, I don't know. <laughs> Manfrono, Manfrono, or Manfrone. So it's based on the man's name, Manfrone. And again, uh, who said this now? I'm trying to th think who... I think it was Alberto Mosca again says that it, uh, it that name Manfrone of Caldez appears in records around 1480, but they're they're documented uh, before that, and he says that they are the only surviving family of the ancient nobility of Caldez. They're the only ones that still exist of those ancient families, with the surname, I suppose, is what he means. So, uh, so yes, they go back to uh, the 1400s certainly, and they were and he believes that they were also a um, a line of the Dalla Caneve family. So I did organize this. So the Bonomi and the Manfroni, he says, are both patronymically named lines from the Dalla Caneve, which are not in the record. So if you see Dalla Caneve, you know that they're all connected or at least theoretically this is what this is what uh, alberto mosca is saying and he says that they also show signs of being uh employed by the counts of flevel which is uh, more evidence that he gives to to support the fact that they were part of the bella Caneve family because they were also uh servant not servants but in the employment of of the counts of flevel so uh so manfroni is another patronymic based on a male personal name, Manfrono or Manfrone. <laughs> However you see it, it's spelled in different ways. And again, that goes back to the mid to late 1400s. So very old family, very old family. I have some, uh, I have, again, some beautiful um, stemmi that Botea drew, which I'll share with you. Uh, there was, uh, he says, the first known title uh, and a stemma of nobility was awarded uh, in April 1545, uh, 1554 to a captain. I don't know if it means captain of a of a military, of a ship, or a, or, or a castle, because <laughs> there are different types of captains. Giovanni Giacomo Manfroni, and he actually is one of Robert Yusko's ancestors, which is how I found him. And so this was awarded to him and also to his brothers. So all of the legitimate heirs, and this was awarded by, again, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, Ferdinand I. And I found that stemma, and it's a lovely stemma, and it's drawn by drawn by uh, Father Botea. Um, the many, many, many other awards, they were elevated to the rank of knights uh, at some point. And what's interesting about this family is, if you know something about Trentino history, when Napoleon came in at the end of the 1700s, he abolished the, well, he did a lot of things. He abolished the, he, the, he dissolved the Holy Roman, Holy Roman Empire. He dissolved the bishopric, the prince bishops of Trento. So they no longer were rulers of Trento. And he also uh, ostensibly banned nobility, abolished, not banned, but abolished nobility, so no more nobles. So it was all kind of in that era of time where, you know, all those ideas of democracy, not that he was a Democrat, he was a dictator, but it was when all of those ideas were changing, social, lots of social change were, was going on at the end of the 17th, end of the 18th century, end of the 1700s. However, he didn't last very long in Trentino. They threw him out after 15, 20 years, he's gone. But uh, so so what happened when he was thrown out? Another empire took the place, but it was the Austrian Empire at this point. Uh, not yet the Austro-Hungarian, first it was the Austrian Empire. So what what's interesting is that there were a few families in Trentino who managed to maintain their noble titles after all of that happened, not too many. And so usually they're the higher up ones and the more ancient ones. Now, Manfroni are one of them. The Manfroni family managed to maintain their noble title and, in fact, get another enhancement of their noble title in the mid-1800s from 
the Emperor of Austria. So this is from, uh, who's the emperor then? Uh, Francesco Giuseppe in, um, in, 15, in 1855. So this was yet another award. And then another one in 1874, they were actually elevated to the ranks of barons. Now this is at the time when people are already starting to emigrate out of the province. So it's quite late to be receiving titles like this. So they are quite an ex quite a surviving noble family uh, in Trentino. And as I say, that's not very typical. There's a lot more I could say about them, but it's like too much, so I'm not gonna go there. All right, so moving back in the alphabet, going back to the first family I mentioned was Antonietti. Now, Antonietti originally, and I mentioned this in the group when I had posted a, um, uh, a stemma of theirs. So I think I actually did them on a surname of the day. I can't remember now. I think I did. Yeah. Their original surname was Dalla Piazza uh, or <coughs> in Latin. It's uh, De Plateo or De Plateis, however you pronounce it. Sorry. Uh, and so you'll see it written in different forms, which basically means of the plaza. So it's kind of a, a, a toponymic name, a name based on a place name. However, Antonietti is not based on a place name. It is another patronymic. And the patronymic is based on the name Antonio. Now, there's a long kind of lineage around it, but it, it started around, let me try to find the, uh, the date. Yeah, the surname starts to appear around the year 1600, and it does come from a patriarch named Antonio, who was called, uh, he had a nickname, Toniette. And so everybody descended from him or his children. They started calling themselves eventually Antonietti. Now, they were another noble, a noble family. Uh, they were probably nobility before the year 1500. Uh, but around uh, the year 1570, they were elevated to a special rank called the Conte Palatino. Now, they, they, which means Palatine counts. And that is a, and that was in the year 1645. It's kind of a hoop de doo title that was given. It's kind of a throwback to the Roman Empire title that had more prestige than it actually had meaning in terms of power. But it did give them quite a lot of prestige. So that was their title. So they were in another noble family. And uh, let's see. And they were also granted lots of titles by various prince bishops. Now, a branch of the family settled in Malay. And uh, I found today, <laughs> I didn't know this before, one of those, the Malay guy, he married a Pankeri. So if you're a Pankeri, they're related by marriage to the Antonietti. So the, uh, yes, uh, Giovanni Battista Antonietti from Malay married Caterina Pankeri, and she was from that Giovanni Romedio uh, Pankeri from, um, Bordiana area, and they married in 1680. So some old connection, and they were all nobility in that particular line. If you look at uh, up Antonietti on on um, Matian Trentino, there are no, there are no more in Caldez in Malay. They're gone. But you you will you won't see any after the year 1825, uh, and apparently they died out in Malay well before that. But as was mentioned also in the group, it the name is preserved, was preserved through a, a female. This is where you do see a girl in the record. She was the last heir of the line. So her husband adopted, this is Ca, uh, Caretta, is that the name? Yes, Caretta. Her husband adopted Antonietti and then they hyphenated the name Caretta Antonietti like that. So the name is preserved through the one of the female lines like that because the name surname actually did die out. Right, so moving on, the next name, which we kind of toyed with a little bit uh, in the group, is Malanotti. I mentioned it the other day because I said I had insomnia. I had I was having a mal Malanotte, a bad night, <laughs> and I was researching Malanotti, and I thought it was kind of ironic. Now, I, this is a really fascinating surname. Now, this again is, well, not again, this is not a, top, um, a, a patronymic. And it's not a toponymic. In other words, it's not based on a man's name and it's not based on a place name. It's based on a nickname. It's a sopranome, a sopranome surname. And the nickname was given 
uh, to someone who had a bad night. <laughs> now, I'm going to share you uh, with you online later the original um, stemma. It actually appears in the church in Caldez, Church of San Rocco, which and it was painted, the stemma and other stemmi there were painted in 1512. The church was constructed around 1510, uh, uh, paid for in part by Malinotti, this Bernardino Malinotti, in thanks for surviving a great plague that had come through, a, 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 an epidemic of the plague that had come through in 1510. So they built this little church and up there, and it's still, it's so vivid, and it's like 500 years old. It's really vivid. Uh, beautiful, beautiful stemma. And what you see in the stemma are two bears around a tree and then a platform at the top of the tree with a bear at the top of the tree. But the bear is actually a melanote. And the and Jean Pancari told the story, although it's not in Alberto Mosca's book, is that the local legend is that he was uh, chased up a tree by a bear and he, or he was being chased by a bear and he ran up the tree and uh, had to spend the night in the tree. And this particular breed of bear didn't know how to climb trees back then, <laughs> so so he was safe. But that's that was the bad night that he uh, that he spent, and so he was given this nickname. Now apparently this nickname was given to lots of people, and they're all over Italy. But this particular family, we know where it started. Their original name was not Melanotti, as you can imagine, because that was a nickname that was given later. Their original name was Arpolini. Now uh, again, now that is a patronymic. Says. Alberto, he says it's probably from the man's name Arpolino, makes sense, but that is also probably from a German name Arpo or Aribo, and so possibly in very ancient history, maybe there's a Germanic source with, with, to that uh, Germanic root to that family, but really ancient because we're we're going back like before the 1200s. So, but to Edding, they've been in Trentino for a long time. Anyway, so the uh, the person who had the first sopranome, I think his name was Bernardino. I will share with you that stemma. It's really beautiful. I, I love it. I think it's lovely. And I wish I could share the image with you right now. But it's a colorful story. And they have had so many accolades. They uh, they even they were imperial advisors. Um, uh, companions to the Queen of Poland, all of these, all of these things. The Malinati were a very illustrious family and have lots and lots and lots of honors. Now we're I'm already at 40 minutes, so I only want to mention a couple of more families quite quickly. One that I found really interesting is the family known as Fatarsi, F-A-T-T-A-R-S-I, Fatarsi. Sometimes you'll see it with one T, but usually it has two T's, Fatarsi. Now, this is a toponymic surname, meaning it comes from the name of a place, but the place is so abstract, if you're an Italian speaker or an English speaker, that you probably wouldn't get it. And I certainly wouldn't if it weren't explained to me. It comes from, oh, and please forgive me, those of you who speak German, because I do not. Uh, it comes from the word tarch, tarks. <laughs> it's, I cannot pronounce it. T-A-R-T-S-C-H. I, I thought in German it's K at the end, Tarsk. Um, it is a place in South Tyrol, actually. It's in Val Venosta in South Tyrol, so up in Bolzano. It comes originally from, uh, it, it, it was written in the records in a really weird way. It says Fare Tarsk or Targsk. There's so many weird, weird spellings. And so eventually it becomes compressed into fatarsi, fatar, something that is easier for Italian speakers to uh, to say. The first person to arrive from South Tyrol into Caldeas with, from that area, his name is Federico, probably Frederick in, in German, and he arrived in the, uh, no later than around 1590, he married a woman from Castelfondo, but they settled in Caldez. They had at least three children, uh, or no, sorry, at least five children. And from them, all of them are descended. Now they, uh, they he was, let's see, I knew he had the mill. Yes, this is what's interesting about him. He was a, uh, what they call a keller. And it's a uh, keller meaning a cellarman or a somebody who took care of the cantina. 
the which could be either the wine cellar or the cold food storage uh, for the Felipe Tun of Castel of uh, Castel Caldez. So he was an he was employed by the lord of Ca of the castle in Caldez. That's what he was doing there. So he was he was a skilled person employed in the castle. So that's how he ended up there. He worked there. And so sometimes in the records, you don't see the surnames. You will see the name Keller. And as in English, we spell Keller with a K, and it's also spelled with a K in German. But in Italian, it's often spelled C-H, because they don't use K. <laughs> so the C-H-E-L-L-E-R, Keller, like that's not pronounced Cheller or Scheller, it's Keller. And that wasn't really his name. That was his occupation, but sometimes in the records, this man and family, they're related, they're referred to as Keller, not Fatarsi at all. It's because of his occupation. So kind of like could have gone either way. He could have developed a surname based on his occupation, or, or but he actually developed a surname based on his place of origin. So it's a toponymic surname, quite colorful, quite interesting. I find that really interesting. Just two quick other ones. Another name is Rosani. It's another patronymic. It's based on an ancient name, Rosano. There was a Rosano of Caldez in the 1200s. Again, this is an ancestor of one, one of an Robert's ancestors. The Rosani tree has a lot of gaps in it. So it kind of leaps from the 1200s over to here to here. Uh, I think Alberto Mosca has filled in some of those gaps a little bit, but I haven't studied it uh, fastidiously enough to figure it all out. But I feel like there's a few leaps of several generations from one name to the other. But the the original source of that surname is a man named Rosano before the era of surname. So Rosano of Caldez, his descendants became the Rosani. And there was one last name I wanted to mention, and that's Scaramella, because it's such a cool sounding name. <laughs> now, I tried to find out the, what it meant um, Bertoluzza, in his Guide to Surname, says it's probably related to the word uh, scaramuccia. Yeah, don't start singing Queen now, scaramuccia, you know. Uh, scaramuccia, which means a skirmish or a battle, a small battle, something, you know, not that, uh, not, uh, not a big war, just a small battle, scaramuccia. So he says it, 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 that some scholars say it's related to that, scaramella, scaramuccia, maybe, maybe not. but. Uh, I, uh, aside from that, the Scaramella are not Trentini. They are, I mean, not originally. They are from Lombardia. And they came originally from a, uh, a, a man named Domenico, who came to Caldez sometime at the beginning of the, of the 1600s. And came from, I forget if I found out where in Lombardia. I wrote it down somewhere else. But he had a few sons, and all of them... Those are all descendants. They're all descended from the same person. So if you are a Scaramella, your roots are in Lombardia. If you look on a map in uh, Cognomix, which is the map, the site that shows all the surnames, you'll see that Scaramella, while it's still in Caldez today, very, very rare, it's still pretty known in, uh, pretty more prominent in, in Lombardia, in parts of Lombardia. And they were apparently businessmen. They were involved in commerce by the by the 1630s. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say about these. There are loads of other surnames, but those are the most ancient ones that are mentioned in the trees. I left out a few, because, mainly because I haven't worked with them enough. And I hope you find that interesting, even if you don't have family from Caldez, because it has a lot of crossover in other parishes in that area. And it may give you some ideas about how surnames are derived. And also, it's just such colorful history, all of it. So let me know what you think about that. And again, I'll be drawing this together into a blog article where I'll be sharing more pictures. And uh, hope you find it useful. Please do let me know. And so our next Philo Friday is going to be in a month. And since this is February and there are only 28 days, <laughs> it's going to be an exact on the same date. It'll be the 5th of March, 2021. No idea what the topic's going to be. I'll draw upon something that I'm working on then. And uh, once again, this is Lynn from uh, Trentino Genealogy. I hope you all, oh, I see some of you said you have, I see somebody has a Scaramella, a Bonomi. Lovely. Yes. And I see a lot of people mentioning a lot of names. Anyways, thank you very much, everybody. Take care. See you soon. I'll see you in the group. Bye.